Welcome to episode 68. Are you somebody that takes responsibility for your health? Or maybe you know somebody that has a victim mentality. It's always somebody else's fault and never theirs. Interestingly, in today's episode, we talk about the sustainability of the planet and your diet, nutrition, choices and belief systems and how it is all centered around your personal responsibility to yourself. Let's get into it. Welcome to the How to Not Get Sick and Die podcast. You've tuned in because you want to start taking your health seriously, so you don't, well, get sick and die. Here we talk all things health, nutrition, and human optimization. Let's jump into it with your host and resident scientist, Maddie Lansdowne. What's up, my healthy friends? Thanks for tuning in to another interview episode of the show. It's my personal mission to coach 150 individuals to create that sustainable, healthy lifestyle that they truly want by the end of 2020, but more on that later. Now, this is an exciting episode because whilst we've done a few video recordings online, it's the first time we've filmed an in-the-studio session of the show. So if you're listening, you can actually also watch as well via YouTube, and no doubt there'll be snippets about the place on Instagram and Facebook. So I'm pretty pumped about today's guest because he's a heavyweight in the world of food. Across the last few years, he's become a really prominent uh, voice and one of the frontline movers and shakers both here in Australia and overseas for introducing the mainstream public to food as medicine, alternative therapies, and plant medicines. And despite what you might think of what he has to say, if you're a listener of the podcast, then it is very likely you're already open to much of what he does share, as a lot of the time I'm yabbering on about something similar here on the show. He's also a serial entrepreneur, mainstream television personality for the last few decades, restaurateur, natural health warrior, author of more books than I've ever read. His latest project is the award-winning documentary called The Magic Pill, which is on Netflix. He's probably best known as one of the judges for the last 11 seasons of the Australian TV show My Kitchen Rules. And if you're an Aussie, you've probably guessed it by now. Today's guest is celebrity chef Pete Evans. How you doing, mate? Yeah, awesome. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for flying in. Hello, everybody. (laughs) (laughs) I'm excited to have you here, although you didn't bring the weather with you. I was born in Melbourne, and so I'm used to it. And uh, it's always a joy coming back here and... uh, being a part of this environment yeah. in its always ever changing uh, when nature. When did you leave? I left when I was seven, not by my choice, but uh, parents separated. Uh, Mum took me up to Queensland actually and raised me on the Gold Coast. And I came back here when I was 17 and learned to cook and lasted four or five years back in Melbourne and then I moved to Sydney. For the food scene in Sydney? For the food scene in Melbourne, first and foremost, and then a uh, business opportunity in Sydney arose. So. And you've been there ever since? Been there and also on the Tweed Coast, actually. I've got a farm. Oh, nice. Which is beautiful. What type of farm? It's a uh, relaxing farm. <laughs> <laughs> a place for me to relax and uh, my wife. But we have a couple of pigs, some chickens, we have veggie garden and horses, dog, and um, lots of bird life, replanting native trees onto the, onto the property as well to encourage more life. And more resilience, so it's um, yeah, it's a joy. It really helps me balance myself, yeah. from, and keeps me in two beautiful sp- spaces: one in the mainstream world, and then the other one I can disappear and uh, become like, a hermit. Sounds like a place you can detox. Uh huh. It is <laughs> from yeah. reality a little bit. <laughs> well, it's probably the most real thing in my life. Yeah. Apart right. from uh, apart from my children, it's um, it's a connection to the land which I feel like uh, we're very disconnected from in today's modern world. Yeah, I think we're totally devoid of connection to earth, nature, one another, all of those types of things. Oh, I love it. I love watching the birds hunt the insects or the creatures at the dam. It's Everything's eating something, and uh, whether it's the horses eating the grass, and it's it's brilliant. I love it. That's one of the interesting things I find with like the vegan argument mm-hmm. um, is in regards to you saying everything's hunting something. Mm-hmm. And it's, I think there's a bit of mixed misconception and maybe more, I grew up in the countryside, you know, around farms as well. And so I was very, you know, privy to the fact that when I'd go up the bush as a teenager that, you know, there was snakes to be avoided by because they were hunting us or they were hunting a, a kangaroo or whatever. And to come to the city and learn about you know all this healthy culture which at the the time for me was like veganism was a thing and vegetarianism and i think city-based people and this might be a generalization but just have this idealistic view of what how nature behaves Mm -hmm. with itself irrelevant of our involvement and so i i think it's interesting that you say everything is being hunted or, (laughs) or hunting because the truth is that you know when a bear kills a deer or something like it's not pretty it's not this magical acceptance of death and goodbye it's savage it's brutal yeah <laughs> and uh, it's truthful 
and it's a matter of survival and everything in the ecosystem is well balanced for that to happen you know that's why there's less carnivores or predators and more of the herbivores for instance if we take that as an example you know there's a natural balance there's a natural cycle in there you know if it was the other way around those carnivores would die off you know if there was if they're all hunting one wildebeest for instance craziness but there's a lot of those beasts or wildebeest or deer or elk or whatever it may be and there's a few predators you know so everything's in balance and everything is eating itself or, or something else not itself but um it's you watch a documentary on any nature program and it's brutal it's beautiful and i feel like you know you're talking about the vegetarian vegetarian vegan approach to it it nearly feels like and this is just an observation is they want to reconnect to nature and they feel that this is their opportunity to do so and you know i i understand that i was a vegan 25 years ago for four years so i get it i get it but for long-term sustainable health i don't think it's the perfect recipe for human beings and i do not think it's a perfect recipe for the planet i think monocropping you know uh avoiding animal products or is is The most beautiful ecosystems in the world are that of herbivores. You know, the, the greatest prairies, the, the richest topsoil is where herbivores spend time. Because they go through there, they aerate the, the soil, they move, they shit, they um, get attacked by the predators, you know, in a natural system. And then those bones and blood break down into the soil. You know, it's this beautiful system that's worked for, you know, millions of years. And then human beings are, try to outsmart nature. And we've always hunted. We've always gathered. The definition of a human being is an omnivore. No one can debate that. It's there. We can survive off plant and animal foods. Some people choose to do one carnivore. Some people choose to do vegan, you know. And people go, oh, I'm really confused. There's so many mixed messages. No, we're a human being. We're omni omnivorous. It's fucking simple. Yeah. Eat some plants, eat some animals. You know, well sourced if you can find them. Of course. You know, something that's had a great life, that's full of healthy fats, healthy nutrition, you know, and support that. Support that environment or that ecosystem or that industry that is committed to long-term sustainable health for the planet and for the land and realize you're a part of it do you think that it's a kind of paradoxical situation to be in as the most quote-unquote intelligent beings on the planet yet we're being we're so intelligent now that we have ethics and morals involved to the point that that's at the own detriment to our health and it seems like this counterintuitive logic logical approach to evolution it's like de we're introducing de-evolution through our own intelligence we are you know it, it is you know some of the reports out there and uh, our brain size is decreasing you know since the invention of agriculture since we learned how to not be nomadic since we learned to hunt less and gather more there is you know from some accounts you know through anthropological and evolutionary history, historical studies, you know, and this is all documented. Human beings have had a reduction in brain size by 10% over the last 10,000 years since the advent of agriculture, since we've started eating more of these high carbohydrate foods, since we uh, have started living in cities, since we've stopped living in these communities and these tribes and these, these very normal um, some would say beautiful symbiotic relationship with nature and, and the planet and to the animal uh, kingdom. You know, when I spent time with the uh, indigenous up in Australia, far north of Australia, one thing they, you know, when we go to gather food or hunt food, hunting is always first and foremost. We'll go hunt stingray. They'll hunt turtle. They'll hunt wallaby or kangaroo or whatever it may be, goanna. And over their evolutionary history, they've worked out 
they know when to hunt the stingray because of this month and they know because of the seasons that's when it has the most fat which gives it the most nutrition and they know that if they overhunt it it won't come back next year so they've already worked out these systems they know when to hunt the goanna or, or to pick those things off the bush or to dig out a root a, a tuber out of the ground they've they've got this ancient wisdom that they've accumulated over 40 50 60 thousand years by some accounts and now we don't access that information for our own well-being. Do you think that presents a conundrum in that, you know, humans, we're all here and we all should love each other and care about each other, but in you're sort of suggesting seasonal, being seasonal in the way that we collect our food and find it from nature, but we've obviously grown in such abundance mm-hmm. that that kind of concept may be challenging to achieve. And so at what point does it actually become so simple that it's there's just too many humans? as opposed to it being everyone should do their best to be seasonal and sustainable and move out of the cities and, you know, live in nature type thing. That's a, uh, that's a whole other podcast, brother, <laughs> <laughs> if we're going to talk about population of the planet um, and human inter- what happens from our intelligent <laughs> intelligence or stupidity sometimes. But um, all I can say is my philosophy is to mimic to the best of my ability what our ancient ancestors have accumulated through their wisdom. And that is through every traditional society that's ever existed on the planet that has survived, they were hunters and gatherers. Some would hunt more than gather, some would gather more than they would hunt, but they would always do those two things together and nothing would go to waste. And they would eat, if they were to take the life of an animal, which they do, they would eat everything. Nothing would be squeamish or squirmish to them or repulsive to them. Not the blood, not the intestines, not the heart, not the liver, not the marrow, not the brains, not the eyes, not the cheeks, not the tail, not the balls, not the penis, not the <laughs> not any part of that animal would go to waste. They're conditioned through just exposure of reality. Well, it's just fucking common sense. You take a life, you use it. Yeah, I like that logic. All of it. Like, there's no debate, yet you go to a supermarket or even a butcher these days, try to find that, you know? It goes to the dog food manufacturers or whoever. So it is getting used in some way, but for us as human beings, we're so disconnected, and I'm generalising here. Of course. But if anyone looks at my social media, the one thing that I post a lot of is offal. And oysters, because these two things are the most nutrient-dense food on the planet. No plant could ever compete against what's in an oyster or what is, say, liver from a grass-fed cattle. Nothing can compare. Not in nutrient density from the vitamin, what's contained in that perfect food. You know, so even there, the debate's done. You know, I hear the vegetarian vegan movement, but in terms of quality of nutrient dense food for us as human beings, nothing compares. So if we have these foods that are so full of vitamins and nutrients for us that eclipse anything on the plant based world, why would we not eat them and make them a a, a major part of our diet or even just a, a small part of our diet? So we're getting that. Yeah, absolutely. The, the thing that comes to my mind um, is in a, one of my own epiphanies in my own journey at learning about nutrition was that a wolf pack, like animals who we, you know, assume to not be conscious like us, when they make a hunt, when they do a hunt, the head wolf gets the liver. Mm-hmm. Like they literally figure it out like that, that the most nutritious thing goes to the, the boss. And through ancient uh, studies of indigenous communities all around the world, the same thing would happen we would, as a human species, save the liver. We would save the marrow. We would save the brains for the most important member of that tribe, which was the expect, the, pe- the, the couple that was going to reproduce, or for the sick, or for the elderly. So they would always, they would be the, the lead wolf, for instance, as, as the, um, as, as a, um, reference point or, or as a similarity in that. So if you were 
attempting or that was part of your plan to conceive. There's the old ancient saying about uh, the Native Americans. They would plan seven generations in the future. Wow. Now, it's a big plan. if we look at how we reproduce these days, and I'm generalizing here, but how much thought goes into making sure that the female and the male prior to conception are fueling their bodies with the most nutrient-dense foods on the planet, which our ancient forebears and ancestors did as a priority. There was no debate in that. That's how it was. How are we setting ourselves up mentally for this journey of bringing in a new life? Are we looking at our belief systems that we hold? Are we going to transfer, transfer them to our children, our own fears, our, in, our own insecurities? How are we going to communicate with those children when they, when they are growing up? Are we going to stick them with an iPad and say, here's your babysitter? Or are we going to communicate with them and teach them the basic necessities of life, which is connection, which is being able to listen which is being able to learn, which is being able to share, which is being able to teach, which is human nutrition, how to control our emotions, and maybe control is not the, the right word, but how to understand our emotional belief patterns, how to have more awareness for and compassion for our fellow humans instead of uh, where we are in today's day and age so there's there's a lot to bit take into this and that's why it's a it's a wonderful top your topics to explore is what does it mean to be human it, ca know? it came up for me just then that also finances and everything you're talking about is like the shit that they don't teach us at school which we actually need for everything it's like learning money learning emotions learning how to be with other people learning health like they don't teach anybody that and it blows my mind as well that like looking into other cultures and their history of medicine and whatnot is that particularly with Western culture, we're not taught how to breathe because mm -hmm. it's like all these automated functions. We just think they're there so they don't need attention. And so we don't learn how to breathe. We don't get taught how to use our brain for memory in school ever. We go through minimum 13 years in Australia, at least if you're lucky. And you're never taught once how to file the information in your brain. Mm -hmm. Like it's just insane that we neglect these automatic functions of the human body. We've created that. Totally. We've let it happen. You know, and then when people challenge that, what happens? It goes bad. Well, no. The, anything that gets challenged that is against the norm, it creates an energy shift in that, you know. It's like, ooh, well, am I responsible for that? You know, if we have to take personal responsibility over every action... So if we are sick ourselves, if our children are sick, personal responsibility and accountability for that, how our education system is, personal responsibility and accountability over that and not just palming it off to the powers that be. You know, if you send your child to a school and they're not thriving in that situation or environment, maybe that, that environment is not suitable for them. Because as you know, Every child learns differently. Some are kinetic or they like to touch yeah, to be able to learn. Some people like to see the information so that they can retain it and it makes sense to them. Some people like to hear it. And if they're not being taught in that way, if they're more respect, uh, responsive or that's sort of their primary way that they learn and they're in a classroom where their needs are not being met, then that kid is going to fail. And they could be very highly intelligent people, but they're just not given the opportunity and the environment for them to grow and to learn. And it's like so many things in life. Same thing with diet. You know, I, the current statistics are mind-blowing in this country. Two million people with some form of diabetes or pre-diabetes. It's nearly 10% of the population. I think the last figure for PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, for women was up to a million women with this. Autoimmune disease is rising at, a, yeah. <laughs> at, at an alarming rate. Astronomical, that number. Cancer, as what you're familiar with. Almost at one in two for cancer. Heart disease. Mental illness. Behavioural issues. You know, find me a person that doesn't fit into one of those boxes. 
And it's a very, you know, anyone over the age of 40 or 50 that isn't on some sort of medication or using something to help calm their system or to find balance that could be alcohol or drugs or whatever it may be, pharmaceuticals. You know, it's quite rare these days and it's getting worse. And there are simple, simple tools. And, and again, as you said, come back to what it means to be human. How have we evolved to eat? How have we evolved to sleep? How have we evolved to breathe? How have we evolved to move our bodies? in a functional way that means something instead of going to the gym and being fucking an idiot. Just bicep curls all day. Oh, fuck. <laughs> How do we talk to others and communicate to others? Do we look at people in the eye? Do we listen to what they're saying? Are we connecting? Are we fully present in, in that environment? And are we doing that to ourselves? When we have these thoughts, are we being paying attention to these thoughts? Whatever goes through our minds where did that come from is it self-worth issues is it is it um, disconnection from ourselves you know can i feel can i express myself can i f open my heart do i have compassion for my fellow human beings or am i in competition with everybody else to get the scraps that are out there because we live so many of us have a talking about the population thing before we have this belief system that there's scarcity, that there's not enough for everyone. The amount of people I've spoken to recently, and this is a recurring theme that just keeps popping up even today in the Uber driver, talks about that they're in business with their best friends or family members, and they've stolen from them. Like lots of money or time or whatever it may be. And it's like, well, what position is that person operating from? To do that to one of their closest friends? Is it from a belief of scarcity? Is it a belief of competition? I need to have more than that person and the only way I can do it? Is it through greed? I don't know, you know, and this is what I'm talking about. Can we have awareness to why we behave the way that we behave? Who's going to teach us that? Well, that's, I think, it's a community. It's looking back to like the tribe mentality is that everybody plays their part and everybody, it's a shared responsibility and we take responsibility for ourselves and as individuals. And I think the message is, especially in this internet world, this social media instant gratification world, is that responsibility for a lot of this stuff actually takes more than five seconds. Like there's emotional processing to do. There's like years of education that has not been given to grown men that don't know how to process emotions that weren't mm -hmm. given the tools that, as five-year-olds and so you know that kind of makes me think you know you get a lot of heat in in the media and you've mentioned belief systems and it's an energy shift and responsibility and i feel like that's the problem is that the, the people that give you the heat in the mainstream sort of or the mainstream masses that hear your stuff they're like ah, oh, that hippie or that paleo diet religion or whatever you know whatever shit they're giving you the, i think the reality is that those people haven't inability or have don't have the resources to understand how to be introspective and at what point introspective is more important than you know being external because i think everyone's external right no responsibility it's pete's fault his advice is terrible this is ridiculous or it's or it's my fault or i heard this on a podcast so w what do you think it is in people to get that because it needs to be that energetic responsibility shift in them not them just to do a diet Hmm. Okay. So let's go down the rabbit hole. <laughs> I love <Shall> rabbit we? holes. <laughs> so let's just, uh, let's take the media for example and what you said, you know, giving heat. So the only way that that media organization can exist is by people giving it energy. Absolutely. There's a wonderful book years ago written by Michael Crichton who wrote Jurassic Park. And I recommend everybody to read it. It's called State of Fear. He wrote about climate change or global warming 20 years ago fascinating book and it was called state of fear it was about the manipulation of the media to promote a state of fear for the general population to push an agenda now 40 years ago they talked about climate cooling 20 years ago they called it global warming the last five years have changed it to climate change now, if you look in any paper these days or hear anything, the most common news stories, apart from the coronavirus at the moment, is 
Climate change. Now, why is that? Control. I, I'd recommend reading that book. You know, it's fiction. Take it with a grain of salt. But it's good to have different viewpoints. And how does it change your life? If you were oblivious to it, I'm not saying to be oblivious, but again, be aware. But you have to understand how the system works and why the system keeps doing what it does. And if you step out of the system, no one has control over you except yourself. That and comes with the comes with the fact that you have to take responsibility once you're out. Well, we <clears throat> I'm gonna generalize here, but in this country we seem to have a victim mentality where we play the victim. We do not like to see people succeed. Well, they can succeed to a certain point, <laughs> but if they get too successful, we like to chop them down. Yeah, tall poppy syndrome is so toxic in Australia. Uh-huh. And then, if they've been beaten up enough, yeah, we've got a, that, she'll be right, mate. He's, they've, they've copped it enough. Let's build them back up again, <laughs> but not build them up too high. You know, they've, they've copped it. So it's really interesting to actually understand our cultural programming as well a societal programming that is regurgitated through the media. It keeps these, these themes and these belief patterns constantly spinning, creating fear, creating division, creating sensationalism, removing re personal responsibility, passing it on to the anointed or the people with the supposed power. I shared a post yesterday, I think it was yesterday actually, yesterday morning, and there was four dietitians standing in front of a table of processed food boxes. I didn't see any food. That doesn't look like food to me. Now, we know for a fact that the Dietitians Association over the last however many decades has been, have had corporate sponsorships from these multinational food corporations. Now, they're trying, this is what, to educate people how to eat healthier. And my simple question was, where is the food that people have hunted and gathered on that table? Where is the fresh meat, the fresh seafood, the eggs, the fruit and vegetables? Everything that doesn't come in a packet or have a two-year expiry date. Where is that perishable food that has sustained us as a species for millions of years, where is that on this thing, on this table? Why are they promoting and, and saying that this is food? I, I, so now the problem is, one of the issues is, people go and see these people, and I'm not rubbishing dietitians because there's some great ones out there. You've got to find them. You gotta find them. They, they <laughs> exist, right? They exist. Like every yeah, industry, there's of course. there's wonderful people that expand their knowledge base, and then there's the ones that do the bare minimum. Like every industry, there's great chefs and there's not so great chefs. There's the three Michelin star chefs where people wait a year and they travel across the world to experience this person's food, and that person's food is through years of experience. They've extended their, their, their knowledge base. Or you could go down to the RSL and still be cooked a meal from a chef. It might be good. It might not be good. You know, you, you have a certain standard. Now, it's the same thing in the medical world. You have doctors that go through the, the process of becoming doctors, usually very highly educated people. And some will become a version of the RSL or a fast food restaurant where people will go and see them and get that quick fix, you know. And then there's other doctors that have done the basics, then ex expanded on their knowledge base. They might have done holistic um, education afterwards. They might have studied naturopathy. They could have studied Chinese medicine. They could have studied functional medicine. They could have become an expert in breathing techniques. They could have studied nutrition because, as we know, doctors get four hours or seven hours, if they're lucky, throughout their whole four or five or six years of training. 
what nutrition does. I ask doctors that question all the time now just for entertainment purposes at the hospital. How many lectures on uh, nutrition? And the most I've ever had is three. You should ask them how many hours <coughs> they get on vaccine yeah. um, <laughs> education. Right. Right. And so it's very interesting that we put our faith into these people. Now, the functional medical doctors and the scientists that I interview, I seek them out because they've expanded and extended their knowledge base and they're getting long-term sustainable results for their patients. It's the exact type of doctors I get on this show. Whereas the majority of people are going to the RSL doctor, and I'm not discrediting them, but there's a different result. There's a different experience because that doctor might get 10 minutes or 12 minutes as the average these days with their, with their patient. Whereas a functional medical doctor might first set out an hour and a half to go through what is your diet? What is your relationship like with your parents? What is your, or your children or yourself? How do you sleep? What, what supplements are you taking? What do you do for movement? You know, so there's this thing, and going back to the Dietitians Association, for instance, people go to them to learn about food. They're quite often, what they've been taught is outdated science that has been partially funded and manipulated through multinational food corporations. So there's a conflict there. And the question is, why do they never really promote in these sort of um, opportunities that they get to educate the public? Why don't they have the most nutrient-dense food on the planet available to show? I feel like what you're talking about comes back to the core of your comments on the media stuff before. I feel like most people, to some degree, can accept... Yeah, the media sens sensationalized stuff. It's their job to make entertainment out of, you know, good or bad scenarios. But I think what people lose sight of or feel insecure with um, is that where does the truth lie then? Because what, what you're suggesting, and I totally agree with it, is that, you know, like my nutrition education, I purposely looked for a place that wasn't registered with the DAA. Purposely, because I know this, but most people go, they're like, all right, the media's, you know, it's a bit entertaining, it's a bit scary, okay, I can accept that. I'm going to go find some truth, like medical education, and, and then to find out, or most people don't find out, they blatantly ignore that that is corrupt. And that was the big thing for me, realizing the pharmaceutical funding, how it all began, you know, 150 years ago, and the Rockefeller family, Rothschilds, like I've been down the rabbit hole, but I understood that people want to feel secure and safe. Like it's an inherent survival need to know that you're okay. And so when you go and say that I went here for the best, you know, this is the best, I went to Harvard to learn di dietetics or whatever. Well, where does the truth lie? How do I feel safe in a world where everything is corrupt? I did a talk today for a hundred people and this girl came up to me or this woman came up to me and said, you know, I listened to your talk and I've got acne and I'm in my thirties and why is that happening? And I said, well, you know, you might consider removing dairy from your diet as a first experiment. Try it for three months, none, at least three months. She goes, oh, I'll just have a little bit here and there. And I said, well, okay. If you want to understand how our bodies work, why don't you speak to, and I shared her this information from Dr. Alessio Fasano, who's the world's leading gastroenterologist. He discovered this thing called zonulin, okay, and how it basically creates um, larger junctions in our gut lining so that uh, proteins and, and food uh, particles can pass through into the bloodstream, which causes a, a immunic response, I guess you would say. And I said to her, I said, well, this is the deal, you know. Your body is telling you something with the acne. It's giving you the signs. It's saying, hey, something you're doing is out of balance. You know, whether it's a rash on your skin or the acne here or your reflux from the food you're eating or the diarrhea that's coming out the other end or the mental clarity where you wake up and you just don't have that, that uh, you've got brain fog or whatever the, the symptoms are, your body is giving you the warning signs to say, wake the fuck up. You know, you're out of balance somewhere. So I said, from my experience, acne is usually pretty simple. You know, from a dietary perspective, you might have some emotional issues, but let's just look at the lowest hanging fruit, the diet. We know that dairy can be problematic for 70, at least 70% of the population. So take that out. Try that for three months and see if you improve. If it hasn't improved, then take grains out because we know that gluten and 
and especially grains can be problematic for our gut. So you probably have a gut issue. So we need to heal that gut. We need to get those junctions back together. She's like, oh, I think I, I'll, I might give it a try. Might. That, that was her word. <laughs> and we haven't even got it into how we communicate in our choice of words. I said, okay, well, good luck with your, your trying, you know. And, but I, I, I made her realize, I said, so Dr. Alessia Fasano says that if you have an issue with your gut lining and you put in a substance, say as dairy, and that becomes inflammatory for that or gluten, one bite can have repercussions for up to a year with your body trying to deal with that. It can cause inflammation in your body for a year. One bite. So I said, so many people go, well, I'm sort of doing it 80, 20, you know, I like that paleo <laughs> thing, but I still have a little bit of milk in my coffee every morning because I'm never fucking going to give that up. You know, I can't give up that. And I'll tell you something funny in a minute. And, but, because people believe, and this is usually the, the dietitians, and I'm not picking on them, but this is generally what they say is everything in moderation. Everything in moderation mm-hmm. should be sweet. As long as you're doing partly good or mostly good, it doesn't matter if you do 20% of you know cheat days or whatever it might be but for that person that that little bit of milk in her coffee could affect her for the next three months six months nine months 12 months just from that one cup so everything in moderation doesn't make sense especially when you've got do you want a a bit of cancer in moderation do you want a bit of autoimmunity disease in moderation do you want diarrhea in moderation do you want depression in moderation I i had a client say something similar um, about, yeah, oh, no, I just do it on the weekends. And I said, and the example I always like to give is, it's the difference between no heroin and a little bit of heroin. That's right. <laughs> and this was interesting. So a guy came up straight after my talk today and he goes, I've been sort of doing keto for the last three months and I lost a lot of weight, but, you know, I'm thinking of doing your version with that doesn't have dairy. I said, oh, it's probably not a bad thing to explore for yourself. You know, I never tell people what to do. If they come to a talk, I'll present the information and and say, you know, don't listen to me. I'm I'm not an expert on you. You're an expert on yourself. You have all the answers inside. You are are your best doctor. And, you know, sometimes we need support. You know, if I get run over by a car tomorrow, (laughs) I don't want a naturopath to fucking give me some essential oils, even though I like that. I want to go to a doctor that can stitch me up or or mend my bones or put a cast on me. You know, they're great for certain things, but not great for everything. So, and this guy said to me, he goes, oh, you know, I'm thinking about the taking out the dairy. I said, well, give it a shot. He goes, but fuck, it's going to be really hard for me because I love it so much. I said, just don't buy it. He goes, I don't think I can. And And I looked at him and I said, you have complete control over who you are and the choices you make. If you do not think you have control over the choices you make, who does? That's a scary place to be. You're just a puppet. But, but it's not even being a puppet. It's, it's not having the ability to survive and make these decisions for yourself. Now imagine that guy has kids, and I don't know whether he has kids, and I'm not picking on this guy, but imagine what belief system those children are going to have. It's the reason disease runs in family. It's not because genetics do, it's because recipes do. It's because belief systems run in families. Yes. So... Going back to the, we have the answers, and you mentioned it at the start. So plant medicine um, journeys are a, a, a wonderful way for some people to see themselves in a, in a way that they've never seen themselves and realize that they are completely responsible for everything that's ever happened to them in their life, whether they like it or not. <laughs> and Be confronting. And it, yeah, of course it's confronting. <laughs> because if you're playing a victim, you blame everybody else for your situation. You blame the, the environment. You blame your parents. You blame the system. You blame the government. You blame the place that you grew up in. You blame your best mate that just stole your money like I was talking about yeah. before. You're blaming everybody else. But you've enabled that and you've allowed all of those things to take place because we can change everything in our lives. And it comes down to how we think and our belief systems. And that's why I, I, I'm 
fascinated by this, uh, the different modalities we have to change our belief systems. Some people use meditation. Some people see different therapists. Some people use yoga or movement as a way to access those uh, blocked emotions or suppressed emotions that then release. Some people use plant medicines as a, as a way, as a technology or a tool to really get to understand who they are. And in those experiences, you cannot hide from yourself. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, you're in, what, what's the saying? You're in for a... a, a in for a penny, in for a pound. <laughs> yeah, no you choice. Know. You're in. <laughs> You're in, and all it does is gives you an opportunity to see your bullshit and to see areas in your life where you can step up and make changes. And it sometimes can show you, if you don't make the changes, what your life will become. So it's really interesting. So I'm a big advocate of personal responsibility. Careful not to follow any gurus. Make sure that you do, you have adequate support from professionals in their chosen field if you need it, whether it be health professionals or um, um, counseling, if you're going through some tough, tough situations. Podcasts are another wonderful tool that's free where people can hear different opinions and usually know as soon as you hear something, you generally have a feeling like mm -hmm, there's a truth in that. You feel it. You just know it. I think that's a great thing about podcasts is that it's a real conversation. And so the listener can actually it, trust that, well, trust their senses in hearing like that it's authentic. Whereas, you know, they come back to the media thing. It's like, you know, they've got a script in front of them. They're just saying what they're told. They're just a, an employee kind of thing. They've got a job to do. Yeah, totally. And if they don't do that job and get the clicks from that headline, They'll be out and they'll be replaced with someone that is more ruthless, that doesn't need to fact check what they're talking about. That's why most media these days, if you, re if you pick up a newspaper these days or uh, television shows that supposedly report the news, they're opinion pieces. I, mean, I, I read something today about something that somebody said on, on a certain network. It was very interesting. We're getting out. We're getting advice now, and from from opinions of other people. And I would say to anybody that's listening to this about me, don't take any of my advice. I'm trying not to give you any. <laughs> and but if something resonates, do some further research. You know, for and against. Check out what holistic animal regenerative farming is. You know, if you want to learn more, check out our film, The Magic Pill, you know, and that's one version of it. And I tried not to make it biased in any way, shape or form. I just wanted to share the truth that I see. You know, it's my perspective. But you can have a look at the work from um, Alan Savory, for instance, from the Savory Institute and see what he's doing in, re in regenerative farming practices. You can look at the work of Joel Salatin, who is doing, who's sort of the, the pioneer of regenerative farming practices, using livestock as a tool to create healthier soil and to sequester carbon and to provide the most nutrient-dense food on the planet for us in a sustainable way. There, is, there are solutions to what you were saying about the global population and how we can feed it. There are solutions. There definitely are. You can be a part of the, the solution by supporting these people that are doing these practices or you can ignore it. You know, I, I choose to support these people because I want to live for as long as possible. I want to be fully responsible for my own decisions in my life. I don't want to farm it out to anybody else because that just gives me an opportunity to blame somebody else if shit hits the fan or goes wrong. You know, to have personal responsibility, I think, is the greatest freedom we can ever have when you say you know you do this gesture for those that are looking in regards to supporting those that are doing these practices which you're obviously referencing support with your dollar i assume yeah do, for the average australian is yeah, it, is it I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pick you up there yeah see this is the where i haven't gone into communication and, and language but just that statement that you just said yeah the average australian what does that mean um, how is it that I would determine that as somebody working middle class job, you know, struggling to make ends meet type thing? Why is that average? 
just, and even the word just the statistical average. use of the word <laughs> There was a there was a saying I'd, I remember on MasterChef years ago, and I couldn't believe that it went out to air, and I don't know how. I mean, and this is this is the state of where we're at at the moment. It said, "Ordinary people." That was their that was their marketing. Doing extraordinary things, I think it was, or something like that. I was like, "Ordinary people." Let's have a look. <laughs> let's just have a look. I haven't done this before, but let's have a look at what ordinary means, you know, because I love doing this. I love finding a word and then looking up the definition for it. Hmm. Ordinary. It means... Um, let me... Oh, no, sorry. We're, we're in real time here at the moment. <laughs> it means average. The average people. Do you consider yourself average? Or ordinary? No. So uh, even then nobody would. Even that assumption that people are average or the average Australian, because that's the that's the feedback that I get from so many people, and every single one of us is unique, is wondrous. We're we're, we're a fucking miracle to be here and to experience this this one journey in this Earth suit. For me, I see that as just. There's no average or ordinary people. We're all extraordinary. We've all got this unique makeup of who we are. So, and it's just, I, I find it really fascinating because that's what people come back. What about the average person? I've got six kids. How am I going to feed them the food that you're talking about? Like, why do you have six kids? Did someone force you? If you can't afford to feed them, why have, you know, that comes again, back to the responsibility side resp of it. And, I, and I'm generalizing here and I don't want to get people, oh, you know, because <laughs> some people, you know, have been raped and sexually abused and they produce children, you know, yeah, obviously. Yeah. There's some horrible situations that there's, there's some horrible things that happen in the world. But again, there's, there has to be some sort of personal responsibility going back to those ancient traditions, did they overpopulate their tribe or community if they couldn't support them? Yeah. Support them? Not at all. So what are we doing? Being selfish in our... If I couldn't afford to feed a child, I, personally, my, I would not bring them into the world. Especially in such a world where so many contraceptive options exist, healthy and unhealthy. Yeah. And, and, and that's my belief system. And, and everybody is entitled to choose what they want to do in this world. Yeah. You know? But I do not believe there's any average or ordinary people. And yes, I definitely agree with you in, in that use of the word. So in, in aiming to pick a word that is better, what about an extraordinary human yes. that is on, on an average income? Hmm. Okay. <laughs> How can they afford to live this way? for the rest of their life is it a belief system thing or is it actually financially just challenging it would depend what it's a i can't answer that because i can't generalize because again we're all unique we're all in charge of our destiny our financial destiny our health destiny our relationship destiny our love destiny we create that through the choices we make every single day so financial, people go through ups and downs and ins and outs. You know, I started off my career as a $3.31 an hour apprentice chef. I chose to work 60 to 80 hour weeks during that apprenticeship so I could move out of home, feed myself, have some fun. You know, I'd have $10 to spend every week on uh, personal sort of things. So I, back in the day when I used to drink, I used to go to dollar night at the nightclub. You know, I'd get 10 drinks. <laughs> that was my night as a 17 or 18-year-old. And life has changed, obviously, and I have different priorities and values now. But um, you do the best that you can with what you have. Now, going back to that nose-to-tail situation, if we're talking about diet and how do people feed themselves if and their families, I generally recommend nose to tail with an emphasis on organ meats and mints 
the cheapest of the cheap, right? And bones to make broths, you know? And that's what our ancient cultures did. They used all the livers, all the hearts, all this. Now, for an Australian, it's a belief system for an average Australian. I'm going to use that word here, <laughs> right? Yeah. I don't want to eat that. that. That's gross. Now, let's transport somebody into Vietnam, for instance, or the Middle East, or South America, or the Inuit, or Indigenous Australians, or the Maoris. What do you think they would have thought about that concept of, oh, I'm not going to eat that because I don't like that? Would have thought that was ungrateful and that's sustenance and fuel and that the earth has provided this for you and for you to reject it is... So what is that? So it's a belief system. Yeah. So I was the fussiest kid when I was growing up. I was that kid that, oh, I don't want to eat that, mum. Yeah, I think I was the same. <laughs> right? Then I became a chef. Yeah. And I feel like some of us go through these journeys of growth by stepping into our fear. And for me as a chef, my greatest fear was, I have to eat this food. <laughs> I'm going to have to learn how to eat liver. I'm going to have to learn not only how to cook it, but how to eat it and make it pleasurable for the guests. I have to learn how to cook brains, or kidneys, bone marrow, blood, all of these things, because it's part of my profession. I did it because I had a goal. My goal was to become a great chef at all costs. And even if that meant going through some discomfort until I worked out ways to cook this food that would be pleasurable for my palate. Now, if you ask me what my favorite food is, if, if someone said, hey, Pete, <clears throat> you're out of here tomorrow. You're never gonna live on the planet again. <laughs> what do you wanna eat? I'd start with oysters, which was my number one hated food yeah, right. when I was a kid. Yeah. I'd start with oysters and I try to eat them every week because I know how nutritionally beautiful they are. Once upon a time, they were, they were free. They were the cheapest food on the face of the planet in so many Western societies. And now they're an, an indulgent, luxurious food. So yeah. things go in and out of fashion. <laughs> I would eat liver or pate. I would eat some brains. I would eat bone marrow. I would eat these foods because not only I find them the most delicious foods on the face of the planet now. And I guarantee in those societies that we've been talking about today, they would also see that as the most delicious food that comes from the animal. I've heard stories of these um, ancient tribes or, or primitive tribes and societies where the food that we get in the supermarket, say like the eye fillet or the sirloin, that was fed to the dogs. That wasn't the human food. That was the least nutritious. They knew it was the least nutritious, like as far as what comes out of the animal. Yeah. The least flavoursome. Why do I want to eat that? Or we'll dry it and we'll use it as jerky on, on our treks for when the real food runs out. Yeah. So again, coming back to that average family about what they can do is they, my advice is to learn, step into the fear, step into the unknown, step into that uncomfortableness. There are millions of recipes on the internet that are free. So it doesn't cost anything to gain information on how to cook something. You can buy a cow these days, which will halve the amount that meat costs. You might need a chest freezer, yeah. you know, but there's these great co-ops and, and uh, institutions or, or businesses now where you can go in and buy half a cow, for instance, and they chop it all up and you get the heart, the liver, the feet, the, all of it. Yeah, nice. So you can reduce your, your grocery bill. Now, the crazy thing about what, I teach, which is a paleo ketogenic version, which is basically meat and vegetables, which mimics our hunter gatherer um, ancestors, is when you eat this way, it generally is cheaper than a standard Western diet. Because you're eating less, you're eating um, the most nutrition, nutritionally dense food. So you, you're not hungry because you're satiating yourself because you've got the fats in there. So it becomes cheaper, if not comparable. So the the budget thing goes out the door for anyone that wants to debate it. If they're willing to eat sardines, for instance, you know, these foods that don't necessarily bring about in our average society connotations of uh, deliciousness. But I guarantee, like, if I go out to a restaurant now and there were sardines on the menu, I'd eat it 
because that is for me now is the most flavorsome seafood on the menu. Yeah. And it's also the most nutrient dense and it's the most delicious. So it's it's a change of thought. Now that's up to the people if they choose to do that or not. I can, no one can force anyone. Or they can say, you know what? Fuck it. <laughs> that all sounds too hard. Yeah. I don't I, I love being in my comfort zone. I really like eating my cereal in the morning. I like my toast with Vegemite on top. I like my meat pie at lunch and my chocolate milk when I'm on the job. I like coming home and having a spaghetti bolognese, for instance, or whatever it may be. Or going through the drive thru and picking up some Maccas or Kentucky fried chicken because it pleases the kids. Or it makes it easy for me because I'm I'm busy and I'm tired. So it comes down to priorities, values, and what are you willing to step into to learn about yourself? Yeah, and on I'm being curious to ask you this on the other side of the dollar conversation, because mm-hmm. um, I'm really big on it and I just wanted to hear your perspective, is something that costs zero dollars, that's super profound and beneficial and all cultures have always practiced that just... Sex? S- <laughs> well, <laughs> it does cost zero dollars, <laughs> depends where you're at, but... Um, is intermittent fasting and water fasting? Sure. What have you, have you ventured into that space? I'm a, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm a very passionate about it, and that costs zero dollars. <laughs> yeah. So for anyone that is not aware, intermittent fasting is basically a terminology for when we draw out or extend our fast. So we fast every single day. We have our last meal at dinner, depending on what time that is. For me, it's generally before six p.m., and then we have breakfast the next day. So we, some people, they like to eat breakfast at six a.m. So if they ate at 6 p.m. at night and they ate breakfast at 6 a.m. in the morning, that's a 12-hour fast. So an intermittent fast just means extending the fast so you either bring back your dinner earlier or you push back your breakfast later. You know, you can do it either way. Some people like to do that. They like to have their last meal of the day for lunch, then have a big breakfast. Some people like to have a big dinner for the last meal of the day, then not have breakfast or have breakfast at lunchtime. So... When we get out of the labels of breakfast, lunch, and dinner, it opens us up to freedom again. So I, because I eat this way, which is a ketogenic version of paleo, I'll just define what that means. So a lot of people that eat ketogenically include dairy in their diet as as one of their fat sources. Now, as I mentioned earlier, 70% of the population cannot digest it. So... Let's remove the dairy because it can be inflammatory for so many of us. And then we're left with meat and vegetables or seafood and vegetables and eggs. And it's very, very simple. And by doing that, what we, by default, we turn over the mechanism in us where we start burning fat for fuel instead of burning sugar for fuel or glucose for fuel. And that's called being in a state of ketosis. Now, if we go back again to our ancestors, our tribal um, indigenous ancestors, they would constantly be in a state of ketosis, but they would break out of it when fruit was ripe, for instance, in that season. So they would probably gorge themselves on a little bit more fruit, or if they found the beehive, they'd gorge themselves and share the honey. So they would break out of ketosis. They go in and out, and generally it'd be seasonal, or like once a year, or, or every season, depending on which part of the planet people lived on. So by definition, we are a human species that has spent a lot of time in ketosis as our primary evolutionary tool for being and we can mimic that through what we're talking about say a ketogenic or paleo ketogenic approach and by default what happens is you just start to lose your hunger so you wake up one morning once you've adapted to this fat burning protocol or system and it's the funniest thing i've helped hundreds of thousands of people do this and the most common thought that they have is hey pete i've been doing your program for three or four weeks and I woke up today and I'm not hungry for breakfast. Is there something wrong with me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no, that's perfect. You, that's that's the goal. Yeah, I have the same thing with my clients. They start just realizing, oh, I just didn't buy chocolate today. Uh-huh. I didn't even notice until three days later that I just haven't eaten it. <laughs> now, for somebody, most of the people that I've helped have been in their 40s, 50s, a lot in their 60s and 70s and even 80s. Yep. And these people say they've eaten three meals a day and snacks for four, five, six, seven, eight decades. They've, they've eaten a certain way all their life. And they just, what they say is they've got freedom once they adapt to this. 
because they're not dictated by their hunger anymore or their cravings or the low sugar levels because they're burning fat for fuel so it burns a lot longer, a lot slower so you don't have the ups and downs so you have mental clarity, you're not moody, you're not irritable, you're not grumpy at your partner or your kids or this, you actually remain pretty steady and I can tell myself, you know, I get a lot of crap from different things and I'm so grounded with it all. Because I know it's got nothing to do with me, but I'm not reactive to it because my energy levels are very stable. You know, I don't have this reactionary um, nature like I used to. So it's really interesting, and um, I, I'm loving this chat actually because we've 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 gone deep into <laughs> into some of this. So intermittent fasting is just extending your fast. And you could try it if you're listening. If, you never want to, if you've never done it, I'm not saying you've got to go ketogenic, paleo, or, or ancestral is the correct terminology of what we promote. Just set a goal this week, if you choose, to skip breakfast. Or just push it out until 10 in the morning or, or midday. Just do it once a week and see how that feels. See how you are for the rest of the day. Some people like to extend that to 24 hours. Some people like to extend that to 36 hours, which is a day and a half, or 48 hours. Some people like to do a seven-day fast with water. Now, I'm not saying that's... I, I can't advise people to do it. You, it's like plant medicines. You're either drawn to do it yep. when the time is right, or if you want to do a fast, you're drawn to it. I do a three to five every month, pretty much. Perfect. And what that does is basically gives your body a chance to reset itself because it, you're stopping putting in the foods so that your body can go, all right, I don't have to spend energy dealing with that at the moment. I can go about fixing the rest of my body if there is any imbalances in there. Yeah. And, it, and, it, it, and it's great discipline as well. It is. <laughs> yeah, you learn a lot about yourself. <laughs> you learn a lot about yourself. In the beginning, it was really challenging a couple of years ago when I first ventured into the space. But now, just it just is. Like, I could just go for weeks. I'm usually interrupted by a social event. Yeah. <laughs> it's damn like, those social events. I'm like, damn, I was going for seven, but <laughs> i got to go out for dinner. <laughs> so, but, uh, but I've loved having you here, Pete. It's been amazing. And I'm really grateful that you made the time to come and join us. And for everyone listening and watching, where can they find you online? Uh, Chef Pete Evans. I don't try to go by too many labels, even though we're talking <laughs> about some things just to identify them. But uh, Pete Evans was taken on social media, so I had to put something in there. So I've put Chef in there because that's usually uh, what people know me for. And if anyone wants to learn more about our program, it's called The Paleo Way. It's 10 weeks and it's free. And we've had 100,000 people do it in Australia. And wow. guess how many complaints we've had? How many? Or people that have gotten sicker? <laughs> None. <laughs> Zero. Sicker, yeah, I bet. <laughs> Zero. Yet, it's apparently extreme. Yeah, right. But I tell you what, you take those uh, indigenous folk and show them what's in a supermarket these days or what the dietitians are promoting, they'd laugh at us. Absolutely. They, they, go, be, they wouldn't even know what it was. They go, where's the food? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but they'd imagine them eating it. Yeah. Cornflakes with nothing on it. Oh. Yeah, they'd find it repulsive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I'll put all your links in the show notes below for anyone watching and... Thanks so much for being here. So I'd, I'd love to wrap up with this last one. What is one piece of health information you wish more people knew about? Uh, they have all the answers. I love it. Thanks so much, Pete. Appreciate it. We'll catch you on the next episode. Thank you. Mm -hmm.